Good morning, and welcome to Comics for Breakfast. I'm your host, Sweet Willie Johnson. Critters, you're going to have them. The comics medium is chock full of animal-inspired characters. You don't have to go far in any direction, from the metaphorical musical miming of Josie and the Pussycats to the soberingly literal Ninja Turtles. Nature's influence pervades every genre. Today, we're getting specific, looking at three animal-inspired heroes. Wait, don't go. I'm not going to foist some tired old Batman or Spider-Man story on you. You come to breakfast for exotic fare, and that's just what I intend to deliver. So strap on your feed bag, tug on your thigh-high waiters, and join me as breakfast goes wild. Our first comic got a bit of a tease last week when we spoke about Harvey's Black Cat, and while that issue was a speculative fiction-style anthology, this issue is strictly fantastic feline fisticuffs. Now, some of you may be thinking, hold on a second, sweet James, that's not Black Cat. Where's her platinum hair and fur collar? Well, that's a whole nother cat, my friends. This here is the original, and she's more than just someone's sticky-fingered girlfriend. The black cat is secretly one-time stunt woman turned Hollywood starlet Linda Turner. Linda's socialite connections and jet-set lifestyle ensure she's at the heart of all of the action. With her knowledge of both stunt work and martial arts, along with a little bit of that black cat luck, she's more than a match for the forces of injustice that rear their ugly heads. Let's get to it. In our first thrilling episode, the black cat encounters the legend of Blasco. Millionaire Tim Turner has bought the long-closed Blasco Theater with an eye towards reopening. Daughter Linda offers to be its resident star, but Dad isn't one for nepotism. Still, he'd be obliged if she'd pop by and take a look. And he's right to be concerned, as gangsters have taken up in the theater and want it for their own. The next morning, the Turners drop by, and after a little strong-arm type negotiation, the gangsters decide to get serious with the elder Turner. Daughter Linda gets wind of something strange and heads backstage, where she assumes the guise of the black cat. She follows the cigar-smoking stooge to the footlights, only for a front-row seat for the debut of the Ghost of Blasco. The ghost claims to have killed himself years ago and has cursed the theater much to everyone's shock. The cat, however, quickly gets to the bottom of things. It's all just a ruse engineered with ropes and pulleys. However, Cigar Stooley is about to drop a sandbag on Dad, and we can't have that. Cat leaps to his rescue, saving Dad and dropping the Stooley. Wannabe Bo Rick throws in with a well-timed grapple, but it's the cat who wins the day by knocking the gun from the bruiser's hand. The offender is subdued, and it seems a mystery is afoot. Meanwhile, the criminals have learned their attempt at scaring off the new owner has failed, but instead of fleeing, they double down, finding some guys to go and make trouble on their behalf. Dressed as movie monsters, they storm backstage, terrorizing the actors. Undeterred by these shenanigans, the cat comes on, mowing the costume crooks down like so much chafe. It's notable to see a female character shown as competent and capable. Unlike Wonder Woman, the cat had no special powers or magical abilities. She relied solely on her training, skill, and moxie, facing adversity with nothing but a cocksure grin. She defeats multiple opponents soundly, finding the entrance to the secret lair in the process. It's there Tim and Rick are held by the gangsters, who pressure Tim to sell. 
The cat appears and busts up the little clatch, although everyone gets in a shot or two at the end. Gangster Inky spills the beans, revealing the theater is the site of the gangster's counterfeiting operation. The crooks are sent to jail, Rick gets a story, and Linda and her father share a laugh. Instead of some crummy text story, Harvey fills out the issue with some one-pagers that teach the reader judo. Now, I'm not sure how effective these moves are, but hey, you can't argue with that artwork. Next up is a bit of glorious insanity called Linda Turner Goes to a Party, featuring cameos from Hollywood royalty like Jimmy Durante, Charlie McCarthy, and Bob Hope. It's the sort of oddity that you can only find in an old comic. I won't ruin the nuances and subtle intricacies for you. Track down a copy and read it for yourself. In our final tale of the issue, the cat encounters the Skull Island Beasts. Century Pictures has sent a boat to distant Skull Island to begin production on their new film, Cutlass Gold. Jeez, did they not see King Kong? Skull Island is bad news, as evidenced by these skulky types hanging around the docks. They get Linda's dander up, and it's not long before she's catting about the island looking for trouble. She finds it in the form of Baldy and his clams. Suffice to say, it's a shakedown, with Baldy trying to drive the film crew from the island so his criminal operations can proceed apace. Three members of the film crew are abducted and driven out to sea, where they're held fast by a mouthy mollusk. Luckily, the cat is there to lend a hand. Well, a paw, anyway. She dives in, swimming out to the oversized bivalve. Using a rock, the cat manages to pry the clam's jaws apart, freeing the film crew. Unfortunately, even cats need to breathe, and she's forced to the surface. The gang thanks her, and she swims off, returning to shore. The next day, filming begins with Linda as the damsel in distress. Baldy, angered that his men have failed, sets out to derail the production by ramming the boat. Black Cat intervenes, bringing in the Coast Guard. Everyone's caught save Baldy, who the cat then tracks down and hunts like the rat he is. Attempting to escape, our heroine lassos the criminal, bringing his grandiose plans down to earth. Now, I first discovered the Black Cat when I found this book a decade ago. Sure, I'd seen the character around, but to be able to actually enjoy these stories as they were intended uh, in this nice king-size annual edition made me really appreciate the character. Later, I discovered the fantastic line of reprints, which ran for ten issues. They remain an affordable alternative to the originals, printed on nice paper with clean, bright colors. If you're a fan of the Black Hat or just fun comics in general, they come highly recommended. And now, for something completely different. Every once in a while, a book will just jump out at me from the newsstand, demanding my attention. Our next selection not only jumped out, but it humped my leg and ripped my pants in the process. It's Fat Dog Mendoza! Now, I knew from the moment I saw this cover, this book was meant for me, and you as well. Created by writer-artist Scott Musgrove, the character made his debut in this book from Dark Horse in December of 1992. Who is the enigmatically named Fat Dog? Well, why tell ya when I can show ya? He's rich, handsome, a world-class scientist, and globe-trotting socialite. He's Fat Dog Mendoza, and you're not. A nameless child of the soil is given a gun and told to shoot his pet, Moist Dog, on account of maybe rabies? However, the boy misses at point-blank range. Moist Dog, understandably taken aback by this turn of events, bites the child and runs off. Later, around the dinner table, Pa expresses his disgust at his son's inability to kill, even at point-blank range. His son, however, isn't feeling so well and collapses onto the dining room table. A la Alien, a new dog bursts from the child's corpulent form. A fat dog. Soon the boy recovers, the family heads off to bed, and a new hero is thrust into a fecund world. 
In our next tale, Fat Dog and his costume buddy are out for a stroll in the woods. They're having a swell time like pals do when, unexpectedly, nature does its thing, dropping a tree on Buddy. Fat Dog checks to see if his boy companion is okay, then springs off to find aid, only to be pinned under another fallen timber. It's looking grim for our dynamic duo, but help arrives in the form of Dumb Lassie, the neighborhood's dumbest dog. Finally, when things are at their grimmest, Dumb Lassie gets the gist of their predicament and runs off to find help, only to knock herself unconscious. And then the wolves came. So yeah, the stories aren't exactly Norman Mailer. They're not even Norman Fell. They exist more as a showcase for the art, but this strip featuring the whoosh is pretty darn funny. <laughs> He's winded. Speaking of the whoosh, next up, it's the brawl to end it all, when the whoosh takes on bat meat for the love of fat dog. Our tale begins with lemon head, orange head, and banana head down by the old fishing hole. Only something's gone wrong with fat dog. The kids rush to his side to find the canine barring his teeth and foaming at the mouth. Fat dog is rabid, and the only cure can be found deep in the Amazon rainforest. The kids hop on a plane and, before you know it, are south of the equator. A string of horrifying incidents then befall our heroes, from Banana Head lopping off his hand in a propeller blade to the gang losing all of their money and possessions in a hotel fire. Things go from bad to Neville shoots on the beach for the fruity trio. They somehow manage to escape not only prison, but being boiled alive, eventually making their way back to America with the cure. Only Fat Dog was playing a foolie on them. This trip is shot through with the sort of dark humor prevalent in late 1980s indie books like Gregory or Mark Byers' Agony, while at the same time also carrying a touch of that Charles Burns-esque gravity. It certainly gives the book a unique tone. Our next tale concerns a show-and-tell at school. The kids talk up their various possessions, like tonsils preserved in 7-Up or Onion Head's, um, head, but what catches Fat Dog's attention is Stinky's pet dog, Precious. Fat Dog is immediately smitten and makes a play for the pleasing poodle. His attentions unrequited, our hero's adore turns to obsession, following Stinky to his home. It's going to take some seriously bull moves to win this prize, but Fat Dog is nothing if not persistent, and before you can say Dominus Vibiscum, the Pope drops by. He's just out spreading the good word and, you know, trying to get reelected and say, maybe Stinky and his mom would like to take a spin in the Pope Mobile. Unable to resist, the pair go for a joyride, leaving Fat Dog alone with his new love. Unfortunately, Precious has choked to death off panel on the bone Fat Dog gave her earlier. Oh, the irony. Our tale ends with Fat Dog reporting his car stolen and Stinky and his mom on the lam after running over Onion Head. Next stop, who can say? We finish with Onward Mighty Squad Patrol. Think Avengers Assemble, only with more down-to-earth heroes. There's the aforementioned Bat Meat and his sprightly ward, Robert. Well, okay, maybe sprightly is a touch ambitious, but making up for it is the evil Dr. Quadrupus, who has four entire limbs to kill you with. And that's just the start of this awe-inspiring roll call. Maestro, start the music. And so it was assembled, the Mighty Squad Patrol. And off they go. Or at least Robert does. Hey, kid, wait. Robert?
So yeah, the only thing weirder than this comic could be this comic catching on, which it almost nearly kind of did. You see, Fat Dog managed to land a sweet animation deal over a Cartoon Network. That's right, for one brief shining moment, well, three seasons worth of moments actually, madness tickled into the mainstream culture. Scott Musgrove has gone on to produce some truly remarkable work, which you can see at the link below. Check in the comments section and tell them Mink sent you. And while we've yet to see a feature-length film from Fat Dog and Company, I'm confident that it's just a matter of time before the world catches up. Onward, mighty squad patrol! For our final issue, we're going feral. Watchers of Comics for Breakfast may remember our coverage of Badger No. 5 from First Comics. This was a tiny relaunch for Mike Barron's character, whose first four issues were published by the defunct Capital Comics. Now, this book does a great job of catching us up on the salient story points. Vietnam vet Norbert Sykes suffers from multiple personality disorders. One of these personalities happens to be the Badger, a hyper-violent costume crusader who may or may not be able to talk to animals. Incarcerated for his aggressive tendencies and misdemeanors, Norbert is institutionalized. It is here he encounters Ham the Weather Wizard, a time-displaced warlock with questionable morals. Working together, the two extricate themselves from the institution and set up operations in a castle in upstate Wisconsin. Using magical means, Ham manipulates the money markets, accumulating considerable wealth. Sadly, it's not enough to purchase the property that holds the Rowan Tree, an object of great mystical power. The property is purchased by an unscrupulous real estate developer who cuts the tree down. You got all that? Excellent. Let's go! Our issue begins in a movie theater. And wouldn't you know it, there are a couple of clowns ruining the experience for poor old Peter Parker. Luckily, the Badger is present to make things right. He makes like Mo for this Dollar Knight Larry and Curly, driving the offenders off. Before the Badger can make it a double feature, our hero is whisked away by limousine by employer Ham, who has a new job for him. They head to Kepco, where Ham makes a very reasonable offer. In recompense for its destruction of the Rowan Tree, the company will turn over all of their nature-destroying mining operations, and Ham will spare their homes. Spare them from what? Well, not knowing is all part of the fun. Ham and Badger leave, and their threat is written off as sheer quackery. Later, Kepco exec Howard Koenig rests in his beachside condo, confident the bodyguards he's hired will be equal to any force Ham throws at him. He turns on Carson, and surprise, it's not Joan Rivers, but the Badger, warning the residents of Southern California that a massive 200-foot tidal wave is on its way to obliterate their beachfront properties. The threat alarms fellow Kepco execs, who meet to discuss how to deal with Ham and his costume cohort. Koenig calms the men down. They're going to hold their cards on this one. Certain ham will fold. And speaking of the weather wizard, we join he and Badger in a warehouse in the San Fernando Valley. They have acquired the fallen rowan tree, shaping the ancient oak into an instrument of nature's vengeance. However, before Badger can make like Dennis Wilson, he gets word that his mother has been injured and he rushes home. The next day, a helicopter drops Ham 2,000 miles from land, and the warlock lets loose this little ditty, invoking powerful magical forces. Soon after, the first signs of the phenomena appear on a radar station outside of Guam. A giant wave has appeared, Ham riding its crest, and is headed directly for California. Beaten, Koenig and Kepco execs fly a copter out to the wavefront to agree to Ham's terms. Unfortunately, Ham only knows how to start giant tidal waves, not stop them. He could also use a sandwich. We soon learn that the only one who might stay the deadly wave is the Yak, a Tibetan mystic that dogs Ham's every step. The Yak agrees and is flown to the coast where he begins weaving a powerful spell. But will he finish it in time? Meanwhile, the Kepco execs panic as the enormous wave bears down. And hey, it turns out a whole horde of hodads has hopped on. 
the wave peaks casting an ominous shadow over the beach, untold gallons of water ready to flatten all below. Then the yak speaks, a series of invocations that dissipate the staggering swell in the blink of an eye. Ham rides the now-vanished wave's inertia through Koenig's roof, landing with a beefy thud. He tells the exec to give everything in their terms to the yak. After all, he earned it. Meanwhile, the badger has rushed back home to be at his mother's side. It turns out she was the victim of a home invasion, robbed by some good old boys from the next town over. Oddly enough, Badger's stepfather, Roland Sykes, has been absent for the past three years, making Badger responsible for his mother's debt to the nursing home. The Badger opts to stay in case the punks come back, and oddly enough, they do. They're concerned about the woman recognizing them and they go to rub her out, but Badger's there to make sure that that doesn't happen. Unfortunately, seeing his mother struck causes Badger to have a psychotic episode, reverting the adult back to an abused six-year-old. Defenseless, he drops to the floor, suddenly unable to protect anyone, including himself. As a teenage reader, The Badger was a revelation. It was a blast of fresh air into a medium that had grown closed and stale. Sixty cc's of pure adrenaline straight to the jugular. Unlike the predictable Marvel and DC titles of the time, there was no telling what The Badger and company would do next. With adventures firmly rooted in the real world, this book was a thrilling change of pace and kept Mink coming back time and time again. You can bet we'll be looking at more Badger in upcoming episodes. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, share, and subscribe. Tell your pals. Tell your mom. Aw, oh, who are we kidding? She knows who I am. I'm Swede Willie Johnson, and I hope to see you next week at breakfast. Breakfast. <laughs>